You know, this is, excuse me, a damn fine cup of coffee. Welcome on in to your Midnight Book Club. Tonight, we're starting our journey with American Cosmic, UFOs, Religion, and Technology by D.W. Palsuka. Now, if you've been with me for the Midnight Book Club, then you know that we've read her second book on the subject of UFOs. By no means her second book. She's a doctor of religious studies, and she's written many a book about the history of the weird and the wild as far as encounters that nuns and priests have had throughout history. That's what got her on the track of UFOs, but we'll get into that. Tonight, we're exploring her beginnings, how she got into UFOs, and we're going to get to spend a little bit of time with my favorite motherfucker, Jacques Vallée, and a tour through Silicon Valley. So buckle up, sit back, relax, put your feet up, get ready to get your mind rocked, because we're going to about to learn that the weird is out there, and it's waiting for us. We're going to start with the preface. Mainly because we get to hang out with old Jacques Vallée. So I'll put his picture up here. And here's D.W., the author of Encounters. So you imagine, as I read this preface, these two hanging out. Typing away. Working on American Cosmic, or possibly Encounters, who knows. Preface. A tour of Silicon Valley with Jacques Vallée. These are the hills of Silicon Valley. There are many secrets in this valley. Jacques Vallée maneuvers his car expertly through the daunting San Francisco Bay Area traffic, darting this way and that. Large trucks, small cars barrel towards us on the winding roads, and crashes are narrowly evaded. Every 20 minutes, I lift my shoulders, which are stuck to the back of the car seat, and try to shake out the tension. Jacques, father of modern UFO study, and an early visionary of the internet, is giving me and my colleague, Robbie Graham, a personal tour of his favorite geolocation, Silicon Valley. We drive by places that loom large in the history of the valley. He recalls the early days of the technological revolution. They were on fire and purely democratic, pure scientists, fueled by discovery. Jacques' credentials are intimidating. As an astronomer, he helped NASA create the first detailed map of Mars. As a computer scientist with a PhD from Northwestern University, he was one of the early engineers of ARPANET, the Advanced Research Projects Agency, a precursor to the internet. We owe this man <laughs> We owe this man the internet, the internet, the tubes that connect us all. He is also a successful venture capitalist, funding startups of innovative technologies that have changed the daily lives of millions of people. He is a prolific author. He is probably most famous for being a consultant to Steven Spielberg on the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind, 1977. The scientist character in the movie, played by French actor Francois Truffaut, is based on Jacques. Jacques has perhaps done more for the field of ufology than anyone in its short history, and yet he calls the study of UFOs his hobby. A true and valiant humble king, Jacques Vallée, UFO Man of the Hour. <laughs> this is the orthodox history of Jacques' life and work. His unorthodox history is equally interesting. He worked with scientists affiliated with the Stanford Research Institute. Oh yeah, baby. Mind reach. Now SRI International, an independent nonprofit research institute in Menlo Park. The group's activities are largely unknown to the public, but declassified documents from the 1970s and 1980s indicate that it was a research site for the extraordinary. Jacques did his early work on the internet under a program that Jeffrey Kerpel writes was probably called Augmentation of the Human Intelligence. I think that's so cool that the very first 
experiments with an internet were codenamed things like augmentation of the human intellect. They're already trying to build AI or whatever the fuck on the internet. That's just, uh, uh, just, it makes me think about the internet in a different way. This research was happening at the same time and in the same place as studies of remote viewing, precognition, and extrasensory perception. Oh, that is so cool. So that means old Jacques Vallée was hanging out with my other two favorites, Russell Targ and Harold Putoff, when they were at SRI studying remote viewing. And of course, we know the CIA and the Army took the remote viewing project, you know, all the to the dark secret depths and all the new heights. Still doing it now. But very cool that they were all bumping around together. That must have been so fun in the break room. You know, running into each other. you talking about crazy ass projects they're working on. Jacques Vallée, Harold Putoff, Russell Tarr cutting it up. These esoteric skills were studied under a classified program called the Stargate Project. Funded by the U.S. military in partnership with the SRI. The hope was that the skills and talents of people who were naturally psychic could be developed and harnessed for the purposes of gathering intelligence. In the course of this research, the psychic viewers reportedly uncovered unintended and surprising targets, like UFOs. The participants in the program also reported that they could travel through space to the moon and to other planets like Mars. In other words, the program allegedly developed intentionally or not psychic cosmonauts. And what's interesting, I was scrolled away on a little part of the internet today on this little like forum that still exists, thank goodness. And uh, someone was talking about the gate program. And that and like uh, back in the day when I was going to high school in the ancient times, there was a program for gifted kids called gate and they would test students and then you'd join these, you know, classes that were super advanced or whatever and if the program's not around anymore but apparently there's people who say allegedly that that was like a cia program to find gifted individuals that would work in these sorts of psychic programs i don't know that's just what's floating around out there allegedly found that down an internet hole today thought it was interesting because i remember that program I remember kids like being a part of it, you know, but what are we going to do? So that's what they were doing at SRI, trying to find gifted individuals to uh, spearhead things like precognition and the in developing an internet and remote viewing. Also, the fact that the early development of the internet was going on in the same building as the Stanford Research Institute with all these other quote unquote esoteric things like remote viewing and precognition, you know, psychic abilities. It, it's like, wow, so the internet, early internet, it's under the same category, like spooky magic, this thing that connects us all. Because it, it's basically just making uh, the consciousness material, right? Like what? What we're all trying to achieve, trying to calm our minds so we could have access to it. The internet just makes that material and we could all just instantly get on and get all the information. Let me see something here. I was just trying to get you in there a little bit more. All right, watch out. Get that butt out of here. Hi, huh. is that good? Put my thing down there. Thank you. All right. Perhaps unknown to Jacques and the researchers of the SRI, psychic travel had long been reported. Psychic cosmonauts like the 18th century philosopher and theologian Emanuel Swedenborg crop up throughout the history of religions. Swedenborg claimed that with the assistance of an angel, he had visited Mercury, Mars, Venus, and the moon. He claimed to have spoken to beings on those planets, and he published his experiences in a book, Life on Other Planets. 1758. The activities of the cosmonauts of the SRI may have resembled the interstellar adventures of Swedenborg, but their goals could not have been more different. 
They hope to operationalize the knowledge they acquired about terrestrial targets. Remote viewing was one of the many methods of attempted data collection. These efforts to create human portals to other planets were taking place under the same auspices at the same time as technologies of connectivity like the internet. As we spun down the highway, I recognized the neighborhoods of my childhood, but I saw them now through Jacques' eyes. The streets, the smell, the eucalyptus trees, parks, schools, cafes, all look new to me. Shining with the allure of mystery. As much as I wanted to, I never got up the nerve to ask Jacques exactly what he meant by the secrets of Silicon Valley. You gotta ask, man. When you get there, you gotta ask when you get the question. I wanna know the secrets of the valley too. But on that drive, I caught a glimpse into the exciting ideology and philosophy behind the revolution. It's zeitgeist. If Jacques were an essay, he would be the question concerning technology by philosopher Martin Heidegger, Heidegger, Heidegger. This essay, dubbed impenetrable by many readers, nevertheless offers several intriguing observations about the relationship between humans and technology. As Heidegger saw it, humans do not understand the essence of technology. I'll walk with that. As Heidegger saw it, humans do not understand the essence of technology. Instead, they are blinded by it and view it simply as an instrument. The interpretation of technology as pure instrumentality was wrong, he said. The Greek temple for the Greeks housed the gods and as such it was sacred, a sacred frame. Similarly, the medieval cathedral embodied and housed the presence of God for medieval Europeans. Heidegger suggested that the human relationship with technology is religious-like that it is possible for us to have a non-instrumental relationship with technology and engage fully with what it really is, a saving power. Jacques Vallée is fully aware of the revolution that is technology, although he most likely never read Heidegger's essay. Jacques's depiction of Silicon Valley as the home of the new resonates with Heidegger's vision of technology as bringing to birth a new era of human experience, a new epoch. The symbol for this epoch is the UFO. Carl Jung called the UFO a technological angel. This is a book about UFOs and technology, but also about a group of people who believe anomalous technology functions as creative inspiration. I found these people. In the 1970s, when Jacques consulted on Close Encounters, he encouraged Spielberg to portray the more complex version of the story. That is that the phenomena is complex and might not be extraterrestrial at all, extraterrestrial at all. But Spielberg went with the simple story, the one everybody would understand. He said, this is Hollywood, baby. This book does not tell the simple story, but I believe it is a story anyone can understand. So that is the preface, a little adventure with my favorite cutie, Jacques Vallée. Whoops. With my favorite here, old Jacques Vallée. So that was an adventure with him and DW through the streets of uh, San Francisco. Now remember, always ask that question if it pops up, right? Don't make the mistake DW did. Okay, let's get to the introduction. All right, so let's dive in. All right, each quote, each chapter starts with a quote. And this one is a humdinger I like to think about a lot. By old Frederick Nietzsche. When you gaze long into the abyss, the abyss also gazes into you. As I finish writing this introduction, the television series 60 Minutes has just aired an interview with billionaire Robert Bigelow of Bigelow Airspace. Bigelow founded his company, which specializes in manufactured space equipment, mostly with his own funding in 1998. Due to the reliability and safety of Bigelow Airspace equipment, 
NASA and other space companies use Bigelow's space habitats and other equipment in their explorations and experiments in space. In the interview, Bigelow boldly claimed that aliens or non-human intelligences are interacting with humans and have been for a long time. Now, Bigelow also, if you know um, Tom DeLong, of course you know Tom DeLong. He was working with Bigelow for a while in the star to the Stars Academy with all his disclosure UFO stuff that he went through for a while. I don't know if he's still into all that. I don't really follow it, but Bigelow, if you recognize the name, him and told Tommy D, they got together. I'm sure he told Tommy D some pretty juicy secrets. Is it risky for you to say in public that you believe in UFOs and aliens? Ask interviewer Laura Logan. You don't worry that some people will say, did you hear that guy? He sounds like he's crazy. I don't give a damn. I don't care, Bigelow replied. It's not going to make a difference. It's not going to change the reality of what I know. I was not surprised by Bigelow's statements. They are typical of the many scientist believers I have met since I began my research in 2012. Since that time... I have come to know millionaires and billionaires and successful innovative scientists who believe in and study the phenomena. This was the first of several surprising revelations about the UFO phenomena. People like Stephen Hawking are wrong when they state, as Hawking did in his 2008 TED Talk, I am discounting reports of UFOs. Why would they appear to only cranks and weirdos? The lie has been that belief in UFOs is associated with those on the fringe, cranks and weirdos. In Hawking's words, the truth is just the opposite. This book is about contemporary religion using a case study, the phenomenon known as the UFO. It is also about technology. These may seem like completely unrelated topics, but they are intimately connected. They are connected because social and economic infrastructures shape the ways in which people practice religions. A historical and uncontroversial example is the impact of the printing press on the Christian tradition. The mass production of Bibles in the common languages of the people soon gave rise to the doctrine of the sola scriptura, or scripture alone according to which scripture is the only reliable and necessary guide for Christian faith and practice, a foundational principle of the Protestant Reformation. As technologies shift infrastructures, religious practices and habits are changed. Beyond documenting how technological and infrastructure shapes religious practices and beliefs, the UFO is considered by believers to be advanced technology. Like the spiritualists of the 19th century, believers see technology as a portal or a frequency that allows humans to connect to other minds, human or extraterrestrial, as well as to places outside of the current understanding of space-time. Therefore, not only is the technological infrastructure the basis for widespread belief in UFOs through media technologies and other mechanisms, but also technology itself is a sacred medium as well as the sacred object of this new relig religiosity. Conversely, within certain theological circles, technology, especially the internet, has been characterized as the beast, the antichrist. Technology in these contexts is not secular, but infused with theological meaning. The beast, I mean, <laughs> the beast is definitely out there on the old internet, let me tell you. It's such a dark way we connect with each other, you know, anonymously, mostly. It's like, uh, it's like real, it's easy and it's nice, but it's also like, whoa, you know? A unique experience for an academic. This book is about how technology informs a widespread and growing religiosity focused on UFOs, but it also is a story. It is partly the story of my own participation in a group of scientists and academics who study the phenomena anom anonymously, except for me, of course. The participants are anonymous because of the stigma that is often associated with UFOs and the belief in them. 
but also because there were classified government programs in which the phenomena was studied, necessitating secrecy among the participants to offset any conspiratorial interpretations of this book. I will clarify that I am not read in to any government program to study the phenomena. I was never given privy to any classified information of which I am aware of, nor am I part of an official or non-official disclosure of UFOs to the American public. Yeah, everyone she talks to in here, their bosses, they know exactly what's going on. She, she's trying to tell us she's not a mirage person, a mirage man or woman. Now, what those people are, they're disinformation agents that do work within UFO communities. There's a really good documentary called Mirage Men about it. She's kind of alluding to that. We're going to learn about that stuff a lot more in this book, I hope. I began my study of UFO cultures in January 2012. I proceeded in the conventional way in that I conducted an ethnography of a variety of believers and delved into the research into UFOs and ufology, a branch of research devoted to the topic. I was lucky to inherit an extensive library of resources about UFOs and reports of contactees and experiencers, so cool, from Dr. Brenda Denzler, whose own book, now this is a book we gotta get, the Denzler. Denzler sounds like she is an OG UFO researcher, the Denzi baby, the lure of the edge. Oh, and we are edgy here, folks. The lure of the edge is strong. This work informed my study. The library inc included her own research, as well as the research of ufologists and organizations like MUFON, the Mutual UFO Network, and CUFOs, the Center for UFO Studies and the works of other academics and researchers studying the phenomena. I read the works of Alan Hynek. What, what? We've, we've read Alan Hynek on stream, Jacques Vallée, John Keel. The only bad boy we don't have on this list is old Bud Hopkins. We need to get Bud Hopkins. Then John Mack we got, as well as those people who theorize that the phenomenon of the phenomena academically, such as Jeffrey Kerp Cripple. I gotta get Jeffrey Cripple stuff. Whitley Stryber, we have his book. Deborah Badagagia, we got to get her, Greg Egenhein, Carol Cusack, Susan Lepsetter, and David Halprin. Oh, we got a lot of, we got some work to do. Let's see, will the cat stay here? I'm trying to give you guys a better view. Ooh. Not long after I began, I love that like I'm on the baby steps journey of what DW's been doing. We're reading together the same research that she did to kind of start this journey, which is tight. Not long after I began, I quickly surmised that there is a parallel research tradition within the field of study of the phenomena and that there always has been. There are public ufologists who are known for their work. There are few academics who write about the topic, and then there is an invisible college, as Alan Hynek called it, and of which Jacques Vallée wrote, a group of scientists, academics, and others who will never make their work public, or at least not for a long time, although the results of their investigations impact society in many ways. Not long after I began, I quickly surmised that there is a parallel research tradition within the field of study of the phenomenon and that there always has been. There are public ufologists who are known for their work. There are a few academics who write about the topic. And then there is the invisible college, as Alan Hynek called it, of which, and of which Jacques Vallée wrote, a group of scientists, academics, and others who will never make their work public, or at least not for a long time. Although the results of their investigations impact society in many ways. Halfway through my research, I made the decision to write about this group for a couple of reasons. First, they received no recognition or press, yet rumors about them spawn folklore and traditions that constitute the UFO narrative. Second, frankly, this was the group whose work and members I became best acquainted with and whose stories I found most fascinating. I had to muster courage to write about this group because its members are anonymous. And what I observed of their work places me in the odd position of almost confirming a myth. 
This is not the preferred position of the academic author of books about religion. It is usually the place occupied by authors of theology. In the end, however, I chose the path of writing a book that conveys what I consider the most interesting and challenging aspects of the topic. The parallel tradition of ufology is not known to the uninitiated, but it is well known within the culture of ufologists. Some scientists, such as astronomer Massimo Teradrani and physicist Eric Davis, have confirmed its existence. Teodrani writes, I have been quite heavily involved in the so-called UFO stuff for at least 25 years. In research that is parallel to more canonic studies of physics and astronomy. I know that some anomalies do exist and I stress the importance of studying this problem scientifically, especially when measurement instruments are used. For many years, I've been studying the problem behind totally closed doors. Davis also noted that this aspect of the study of UFOs, UFOs are a real phenomena, he writes, they are artificial objects under intelligent control. They're definitely craft of a supremely advanced technology. He goes on to say that most of what academics and scientists know about the phenomena is secret and will probably remain so. There are scientists who are aware of evidence and observational data that is not refutable. It is absolutely corroborated using forensic techniques and method methodology, but they wouldn't come out and publicize that because they fear it. Not the subject, they fear the backlash from their professional colleagues. He notes that one tradition of study requires secrecy as it is related to the military. It's the domain of military science. The fact that unknown craft are flying around Earth is not a subject for science. It is a subject for intelligence gathering, collection, and analysis. And that's how the government feels about it. That's why they're never gonna discuss to us. We gotta do our own, we got the, we're gonna have to do our own disclosure, folks. And I mean, go out. Find some space aliens, make them, you know, be friends. There are a number of players in this story. For the most part, they fall into one of two categories. There are those who engage with and interact with what they believe are non-human intelligences, perhaps extraterrestrial or interdimensional. The people in this category who are featured in this book are the scientists whom Davis refers they agreed to be included on the condition that they remain anonymous. The second category consists of those who interpret, spin, produce, and market the story of UFO events to the general public. Members of the first category are silent about their research, while members of the second category are very vocal about information they have received. Second, third, or even fourth hand. Often, they make up stories or derive information from hoaxes. It makes me think about the most recent whistleblower, that statement. Not to saying that nothing, not I believe everything he, that dude was saying, Congress and all that shit, but that doesn't mean that he's not being given information from somebody who wants this exact information this exact information out. It doesn't mean he's disclosing anything but what's planned. That's just what it makes me think about. The second of the surprising revelations is that even as some respected scientists believe in the phenomenon associated with UFOs and make discoveries about it, what is ultimately marketed to the public about the phenomenon barely resembles these scientific findings. Belief in the phenomenon is at an all-time high, even among successful, high-profile people like Bigelow. Among those who report sightings are former U.S. President Jimmy Carter and legions of other credible witnesses, including the trained observers of the U.S. Air Force, pilots, commercial pilots, police officers, U.S. US Army personnel, and millions of civilians who are certainly not looking for UFOs. Different polls record varying levels of belief in UFOs, but all indicate that it is pervasive. A 2008 Scripps poll showed that more than 50% of Americans believe in extraterrestrial life. 74% of people between the ages of 18 and 24 are believers. In 2012, 
In connection with the marketing of their UFO themed programming, National Geographic conducted an informal poll of Americans about their belief in UFOs. They randomly sampled they randomly sampled 1114 individuals over the age of 18 and found that 36% believed UFOs exist and more significantly have been to earth in the past. Although not a formal poll, the results concur with professional polls as the Harris poll conducted in 2009, which found that 32% of Americans believe in UFOs. I began my own research into aerial phenomenon after I finished the book on the Catholic doctrine of purgatory. The project was a multi-year study in which I examined many primary sources of European Catholic history. Now that this is where it's interesting. She, she got interested in the subject because so many of the figures she studied in her own work, that is like religious study, studying monks and nuns who lived sick ass lives, studying ancient books back in the day, uh, the experiences they had, the very similar to UFO and entity experiences that people have now. I examined many primary sources of European Catholic history found mostly in obscure archives of anecdotes about souls from purgatory. These sources dated from 1300 to 1880. In them, I found a lot of other unexpected things, such as a report of orbs of light, flames that penetrated walls, luminous beings, forms of conscious light, spinning suns, and disc-like aerial objects. I wasn't sure how to theorize these reports, and I left them out of my book. Yet, I wondered about them. I wondered aloud one morning while drinking coffee with a friend. These reports remind me of, Steven, of a Steven Spielberg film, you know. Lots of shining aerial phenomena, luminous beings, transformed lives, he said. I similarly dismissed his comparison. The next day, he found an ad for a local conference about UFOs and extraterrestrials taking place the following weekend. He suggested that I attend. The conference featured speakers who were experiencers, people who have sighted UFOs or believe they have seen extraterrestrials. They described some of the same things I had observed in my research in Catholic history, shining aerial discs, flames and orbs, and especially how these experiences transform their lives. The experiencers interpreted the experiencers interpreted these as spiritual or religious events. They either fractured their traditional religious belief system or more commonly caused them to reinterpret their traditions through biblical UFO framework, in which they viewed biblical and historical religious events as UFO events. Ezekiel's wheel is the prime example of how scripture is used in this context. Many religious practitioners view the strange spinning aerial contraption witnessed by biblical prophet Ezekiel as a UFO. The television show, Ancient Aliens, offers a similar interpretive slant. This way of looking at anomalous ancient aerial phenomena is not restricted to experiencers, but is common especially among youth such as my students. Could the orbs of the past once interpreted as souls from purgatory still be around? Are they currently being interpreted as UFOs? And there we go, folks. The UFO phenomenon, the entity phenomenon, it hasn't just been happening in a short amount of time, only appearing to weirdos in the backwoods of America. It's been going on since time immortal, experienced by all sorts of folks. That's the, the great lie is that it only, like, you know, as Hawking said, cranks and weirdos experience it. This question was not so mind-bending. I could still fit the data into my academic training, interpreting orbs as social constructions based on extra externally generated unknown event or some type of perennial mystical experience interpreted through each era's reigning cultural framework. The challenge began when I met meta-experiencers. The scientists who studied the experiencers and the phenomena The challenge began when I met the meta-experiencers, the scientists who studied the experiencers and the phenomena. It confounded the academic categories I had been using thus far in my work. The new research compelled me to think in novel ways to understand this group and their research. Additionally, the charisma and conviction of the scientist believers was difficult to discount, at least for me. As a scholar of religion, I am trained not to weigh in one way or the other on the truth or falseness of a believer's claim. When looking into the documentation 
on the proliferation of a belief, there is no need to consider whether the belief is justified or not if one is just analyzing its social effects and influence. My association with the scientists brought about something that Harvard UFO researcher John Mack called an, called an ep, epistemological shock. That is, a shock to my fundamental understanding of the world and universe. The shock to my s the shock to my s s the shock to my epistemological frameworks or to what i believe to be true occurred on two levels the first is obvious several of the most well regarded scientists in the world believe in non-human intelligence that originated in space the second level of shock was galling Rumors of the findings of these scientists inspired hoaxes, disinformation, media, and documentaries based on bogus information that purported to inform the public about UFO events and created UFO narratives and mythologies. I watched several of these unfold in real time. It was hard to remain aloof when confronted by what I knew to be misinformation. Some created as, dis some created as disinformation, some created for the sole reason that it sells. I was so embedded in the research on one level of observing the scientists and on another level of being involved with the producers of media content that it was impossible to be neutral. It was at this point that I felt myself fall headlong into Nietzsche's abyss, stare into it and see it grin mockingly right back at me. In one sense, I feel as if I have been studying this phenomenon my whole life, but I didn't call it UFO research. I called it religious studies. Scholars of religion are well suited to study this topic because religious studies is not a religion, but a set of methods for studying religious phenomena. With a few exceptions, scholars of religion do not assess the truth claims of religious practitioners. The metaphysical truth and the objective truth of, of the phenomena are bracketed so that one can focus on the social effects, which are incontestably very real. This strategy is helpful in the study of the phenomena of UFOs that was advocated by Jacques Vallée in a 1979 address to the Special Political Committee of the United Nations Organizations. He told the committee, that the belief in space visitors is independent of the physical reality of the UFO phenomena. Significantly, Valet himself believes that the reality of the UFO phenomena, but understands that the formation of the mass belief in it does not depend on its objective reality. So we could form a belief basically on something that's not real as a society collectively. But Jacques Valet saying here, it ain't that ain't it with UFOs. This shit's real. One of the scientists with whom I worked, whose methodology is primarily nuts and bolts in that he uses scientific analysis of what he believes to be artifacts or physical parts of potential UFOs, asked me why UFO events are so often linked to religion. This is a fair question. One answer lies in the fact that the history of religion is among the other things a record of perceived contact with supernatural beings, many of which descended from the skies as beings of light or on light or amid light. This is one of the reasons scholars of religion are comfortable examining the modern UFO reports and events. Jeffrey Cripple, working with author Whitley Stryber, articulates this well. In his work, he has sought to reveal how the modern experience of the alien coming down from the sky can be compared to ancient experiences of the God descending from heaven. These contact events the perceived interfa interface between the human and the intelligent non-human being from the sky spawn beliefs and interpretations. These beliefs and interpretations develop into communities of belief or faith communities, Cripple notes. Some of these remembered effects, some of the remembered effects of these fantastic states of mind have been taken up by the extremely elaborate social, political, and artistic process and have been fashioned into communities by communities into mythical, ritual, and institutional complexes that have fundamentally changed human history. We call these religions. Similar to religions, institutions appropriate, institutions appropriate, cultivate, and sometimes intervene in the interpretations of a UFO event. These institutions vary and range from religious institutions to governments or clubs or groups. 
and today to social media groups. Or the Midnight Book Club. <laughs> the formation of belief communities. In the history of religions, a contact event is followed by a series of interpretations, and these are usually followed by the creations of institutions. Such interpretive communities are often called religions or religious denominations. Institutions have a stake in how the original contact event is interpreted. A familiar example is the, are the communities of interpretation that surround the religion of Christianity, of which there are thousands. A recent example of how a contact event spawns community or belief and how institutions monitor this belief is the American-based religion of the Nation of Islam. One of the nation's early leaders, Elijah Robert Poole, who adopted the name Elijah Muhammad. Poole believed that UFOs would come to earth and bring salvation to his community of believers and punish others who were not believers. The U.S. government was interested in Poole and his followers, and the FBI established a file on him and his community. Within the history of many traditional religions, institutions, including governments, have been involved in monitoring and often forming and shaping the interpretations of the contact event. This fact is becoming less controversial and suggestive of conspiracy to UFO believers, and the focus is shifting now to how institutions monitor and sometimes actively shape the interpretations of contact events. Perceived contacts with non-human intelligences are powerful events with unpredictable social effects. Yo, what's up, Dudu Barkley? I'm glad that you're here, Dudu. I'm glad that you're finally here. Nice to meet you, Dudu Barkley. I love the name, by the way. We're reading from American Cosmic Tonight in the book club by D.W. Paul Suka. All about belief, UFOs, paranormal stuff. But welcome in, doo doo. Scholars of religion were not the first to suggest that the flying saucer was the symbol of a new global belief system. Carl Jung announced in his little book, published in the 1950s, Flying Saucers, a modern myth of things seen in the skies. Writing in the late 60s, Jacques Vallée argued in Passport to Mangonia that similar patterns could be observed in folklore, religious traditions, and modern UFO events. Scholars of the history of the flying saucer usually date its emergence to the beginning of the Cold War and pilot Kenneth Arnold's sighting of the nine flat saucer-like disks over Mount Rainier in 1947. Mount Rainier, baby. Boop, boop, boop. Uh, that started the whole UFO craze, babe. That, and then shortly after, we got the Patterson-Gimlin film released on Bigfoot. Then you had the Bigfoot craze, and everyone was seeing hairy humanoids. Two crazes at once. Wild time. Since the 60s, Scholars of religion have made significant progress in identifying the mechanisms of religious belief, including how social infrastructures inspire new religious movements. Interpretations of UFOs as connected to religion or religious traditions constitutes a significant cultural development. New religious movements such as the Nation of Islam, Scientology, and Jedism incorporate the UFO narrative into older religious traditions and scriptures. Popular television programs like Ancient Aliens, what what? provide viewers with interpretive strategies that encourage them to view religious visions of the past through the lens of the modern UFO narrative. No, <laughs> do do, of course not. Man, that, that's a question I get all the time though. Creatures are seen all around the world. Do your research, there's a lot of history to it. Since time immortal, people have seen creatures and UFOs all over the world throughout history. There's not one country or culture that doesn't have a story like this. So no, you don't have to be American. So congratulations, Dulu. You are a creature. We're all creatures, right? We're all, we're all human creatures, baby. Nothing. You could be the alien too. Yeah, you could be it all, Dulu. Nothing's stopping you, baby. Nothing's, nothing's stopping you, my man. My, my man or alien or person or folk, whatever, or creature or doo-doo, if you just want to be doo-doo, I'm with you, man. I, I'm with you 100%, doo-doo. 
Maybe I'm maybe I'm the alien, you know? Alright, doo doo, where was I? Oh yeah, ancient aliens. My favorite. Popular television programs like Ancient Aliens provide viewers with interpretive strategies that encourage them to view religious visions of the past through the lens of the modern UFO narrative, turning medieval angels into aliens, for example. What was once a belief localized within small pockets or groups of believers under the umbrella or term UFO religions is now a widespread worldview that is supercharged by the digital infrastructure that spreads messages and beliefs virally. The infrastructure of technology has spawned new forms of religion and religiosity, and belief in UFOs has emerged as one such new form of religious belief. Real or imaginary? The media's representation of the phenomena often adds some violence to the original event. That motivated the belief. Some may understandably ask, is it real or is it imaginary? It is important to remember that the events themselves pale in comparison to the reality of the social effects. This is, the, this is a shame. The closer one gets to those engaged in the study of the phenomena, the more one begins to fathom the complex nature of these events that come to be interpreted as religious, mystical, sacred, or pertaining to UFOs and the deep commitments of the people who experienced them. Each of the scientists with whom I engaged was passionately obsessed with their research, but none of them would ever offer conclusions as to what the phenomenon was or where it came from. The suggestion that the phenomenon is the basis for a new form of religion elicited sneers and disgust. To them, the phenomenon was too sacred to become religious dogma. It was also their opinion in their sorry it was also in their opinion too sacred to be entrusted to the media because of my dual research focus on occasion I became a reluctant bridge between the scientists and the media the media professionals on one occasion a videographer working for a well-known production company contacted one of the scientists and asked him for a two sentence quote at first the scientist was confused wondering how the videographer had acquired his contact information. He then correctly traced it back to me. In a phone call to me, he registered his disgust. <laughs> There's a lot of arrogance in the assumption that I am supposed to condense 20 years of research into the most profound topic in human history into two-sentence soundbite to be broadcast out to the public so they can consume it with their TV dinner. No thanks, he said. Well, how the fuck are we supposed to consume it, science man? You gotta teach me somehow. Interchanges like this, which I witnessed often, reveal the chasm between those engaged in studying the phenomena and the media representations of it. Ironically, however, it's precisely media representations that create and sustain UFO belief. Is it real or is it imaginary? What follows suggests that it is both, both real and imaginary, and that my friends, is the preface and introduction to American Cosmic UFOs, Religion, Technology, D.W. Pausuka. Hope you enjoyed it. Now, next week, we are going to get to learn about one of the scientists she, who works with her, a guy who goes by the pseudonym Tyler D, and he's worked on every single space shuttle launch since the Challenger. Every single one that's gone into space, he's had an experiment on, and he's one of NASA's top people, and he's a huge believer in UFOs, aliens, and experiences, and he himself has a method of contacting what he considers off-world intelligences that help him come up with experiments or whatever it is and he is like a he's like a special nugget at nasa he's like protected he gets to do what he wants but they keep him from watching any media he doesn't watch any news he doesn't consume anything that would like pollute his brain or distract him very interesting guy we're gonna meet him next saturday tyler d the midnight book club 
So join me. And yes, real and imaginary, right? That is just like science. It's magic until it's proved that it's not magic. <laughs> ain't that ain't that just how it is? I hope you enjoyed that doo-doo. That was a more serious read than I usually do. Usually I'm reading uh, more wild stuff about weird and paranormal things. I love Bigfoot encounters, Mothman encounters, Chupacabra, Goblin, Fairy, all that stuff. I mostly read about eyewitness accounts of that stuff, people who encounter it. But DW is really great because she is straight up proving just like Dr. John Mack did that this shit is real, that we live in a very complex world stacked with entities and consciousnesses that we just can't comprehend. So, more power to them. Hope you enjoyed the